Um, you know, as a, of course, as a result of uh, the COVID pandemic, we were unable to hold our regularly scheduled um, uh, cell task force meeting, which I think was supposed to be next week. Um, so we have pivoted like all of major organizations now during this time to uh, a more virtual setting. So we appreciate everyone joining us today um, for our second in a series of three uh, task force seven, uh, seminars or webinars that we're doing. Um, and uh, appreciate your, your taking the time to come and join us today. Um, we've got a, a good panel lineup here. On, uh, as you can see, the topic today is state tax administration and compliance. We're excited about our presenters and the information that they've put together to present to, to you all today, um, our legislators and staff and our broader um, budgets and revenue and fiscal leaders that are on the call today. Um, so with that, uh, I know the representative Abney, one of our co-chairs is present and accounted for this morning. So I think you'd like to say a couple of words before we get started. Sir, would you like to address the group? Uh, yes, I would, uh, only because you directed me to do so. <laughs> I, would, I would rather not, but yeah, I, I do everything Olinda says, says to do. Now, thank you very much, everybody. Looks like we got about 66 people uh, online right now, which is great. Um, as we did the last one, uh, my stuff is pretty short. I hope everybody is safe. That's number one, yourself, your family, and your loved ones. These are uncharted waters, and these, these times are terrible and tough. But I just want to continue to thank uh, NCSL and the entire staff uh, that works on the budget revenue, tax, and uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff, because it's so important. I use it all of the time. In fact, after the last meeting a few days ago, I had a meeting with my finance subcommittee chairs and used a lot of the information that I learned, and it made me seem really smart. So thank you very much, NCSL, for that. But it's important that, uh, that we continue doing this, even though I'd rather see people uh, in person, but it gives us a chance to compare strategies. It gives us a chance to look outside of what we're doing, take ideas back. And I hear so often in my meetings, what does NCSL think? And that's no joke. People do ask all of the time. So this is great to help us to understand the data and to make some wise decisions. And so it's useful for me. I hope this is useful for you. And I wanted to really continue to thank our sponsors for allowing us to do this because without their help, it wouldn't, it wouldn't get done that easy. So with that, uh, Erlendo, the show is yours as usual. Uh, as I did last time, though, because I have to be on a briefing with the governor in about 45 minutes, I may have to leave uh, after some of the presentations. It's not because I don't want to be there, but I do have that other uh, duty I have to do, so thank you. Thank you, Representative Abney. We appreciate you taking the time here today and, and participating in our meeting. Um, Jocelyn, next slide, please. Fantastic. Well, um, again, we're, we have a, a you know, really good and practical and very informative agenda for us today. Um, first up is uh, um, Deborah Biermann, one of our uh, sponsors, uh, that loyal sponsors that have been part of our task force for, for quite a while now. And um, she'll be giving us a presentation on state tax administration and compliance um, in this pandemic era. Uh, then we'll be followed by uh, Ms. Verenda Smith, who also a good friend of NCSL and has been a wonderful resource for, for a while now from the Federal Federation of Tax uh, Administrators on Tax Administration and some really good practical information for um, our legislative leaders here. And then finally, um, state, state Tax Administration in the time of COVID from um, Russ Brubaker. Uh, National Association of Certified Service Providers. Um, we'll ask that again, if you um, could keep yourself muted if you're not, or since you're not speaking right now, and just we'll keep track of your questions and comments in the chat box, and we will revisit them in between each of the, the panel presentations. Um, so thank you so much again, and uh, let's get started, Deborah. Thank you, Alinda. Um, thank you, Representative Abney and members of the task force. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in today's uh, series on state tax administration and compliance in the COVID area. Uh, today I want to um, provide a business perspective in tax compliance, share with you some of the challenges that we have been facing and I'm sure the states have faced as well, discuss some of the specific issues that we're dealing with in times of emergency and then end with some recommendations for reforms that we believe can help both the business community and the states to um, more efficiently administer taxes. 
So the next slide, please. Uh, so this chart on the left, thank you to uh, multi-state associates, shows there's a varied degree of open-ins in states and whether businesses can operate or not. Um, I live in one of the uh, darkest blue areas here in New Jersey. Um, and so for multi-jurisdictional companies, this presents a lot of challenges. We could have our tax offices in three or four different states and they could be closed but your state is open. So it still presents us challenges to comply with the tax laws um, because of where we may be located in our employees. And many of these challenges that I'm going to go through are probably similar to those that the state tax agencies face. Um, one of the first things was how do we get our employees to operate when we are no longer allowed to go into the office. And many of the employees in the tax compliance function in particular have don't have laptops they don't normally travel that much they're on desktop computers to deal with big data files so trying to get them enabled and empowered and i think one thing that we learned at at t after sandy hurricane sandy was most of our computers now are virtual we don't have my laptop is really just a dumb terminal my computer's in in the cloud and fortunately for us many of our employees are set up that way which helps um, the one of the hard things is the ability to access paper mail um, a lot of states and especially local governments send out the notices in paper they require paper filings they require paper checks and so we had to make special arrangements to try to get somebody to go into the office and open mail uh, scan it, deliver it to people electronically, and then come in to process the checks and stuff. And in today's technology, some of those things can hopefully um, improve in process-wise. There's still going to be challenges when we get orders to go back to work and governments open up. Are our buildings safe enough? Are, are the desks too close? What do we need to do to make our buildings safe for our employees to come back and work effectively? And so uh, I think I'd like to thank a lot of the state tax departments because they have been working closely with us to address some of the challenges that we're facing. Next slide, please. Okay. So um, I think the tax departments in the states are facing similar challenges. And I'm identifying a couple here that have been particularly problematic. One is requiring wet signatures on documents. So that's meaning somebody actually has to sand, sign it. We can't use an electronic signature. That's required us to send documents to different places, get them signed and scanned and be able to, to deal with them. To require um, employees of a corporation to accept a separate power of attorney for each of our affiliates. So we might have some issues that we want to deal with the department with um, it could be audit assessments it could be questions on how to file a particularly complex um, transaction with them and every time we have an employee that might be expert in it we're going to have to get a power of attorney form for that employee uh, to deal with it um, some of the localities in particular and states do not allow for electronic payments um, as i mentioned earlier we get paper notices and assessments and tracking them down and responding to them timely is a problem. And a big one is not given the tax agency's authority to adjust filing dates and returns, assessments, appeal deadlines in times of emergencies. Um, finally, some states do not have electronic processes that are um, data entry systems rather than allowing us to upload documents. So they might say, okay, yeah, we accept it electronically, but you need to have an employee there and keep key every item into our system as opposed to accepting electronic transmissions. Next slide, please. So um, some of the recommendations for minimizing tax compliance burdens and emergencies, I'm going to divide them into two parts. This first section is during the emergency itself, what we're going through right now. And then um, I'll follow that with some recommendations for a going forward basis that I think will make us all be able to more efficiently um, comply with the tax laws. So the first thing is to extend filing and payment deadlines and waive interest and penalties, including 
suspension of interest on assessments, especially if everything's on paper. And when states are looking at this, I think, you know, they're following the feds and they have a corporate income tax and personal income tax, but they're not necessarily thinking about some of the unique corporate taxes on businesses that are in lieu of the income tax. For example, insurance companies pay premium taxes. Some telecom companies pay gross receipts taxes in states rather than um, income taxes. Um, I think so far many of the states have um, addressed the filing deadlines and either legislatively or through administrative action and we uh, participate uh, that. We also um, recommend that you allow for secure email transmissions of documents. Uh, I, you know, secrets, taxpayer secrecy is paramount and protecting that is important, but there are ways to use secure transactions to do that. Uh, and allow companies an option to continue withholding at the employee location while employees are required to work from home and limit corporate nexus. This is particularly problematic because a number of states tax employees on day one when they're home and, and at your permanent work location. So New York, for example, taxes residents in New Jersey who work in New York. So now the question is, what happens when they're required to be back home in New York and work out of their New York home, uh, New Jersey homes, I'm sorry. And so there's a lot of questions around that. Fortunately, Jersey is one of the states that issued a little guidance on that. Um, Pennsylvania and Mississippi have too. They've basically said companies, you have the option to either withhold as you are at the work location or the employees, and we're going to forgive any penalties and interest that occur for this. Uh, extend deadlines for appeals and claims for refunds, especially if they're coming on paper. Our ability to find them timely and then respond timely is limited, so give a little more time during the emergency. And a good resource that I found this on the Council of State Taxation has a tracking chart. And if you, the link is here, and um, I hope that the presentations will be shared. But at that link, for every state, you can find every uh, notice that they've given on a tax compliance standpoint on delays, whether on sales tax, income tax, corp tax, and it's a really good resource to use. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, some recommendations for minimizing tax compliance burdens on a go forward basis. One is to try to eliminate manual processes and paper filings for tax compliance, audits, claims, and appeals. With today's technology, there's so many um, secure ways that we could deal with these um, filings in an electronic way. And this may require uh, as legislators for you to provide more resource to the tax departments to upgrade their systems to be able to handle um, and access some of the electronic technologies. Um, work jointly with other states and the federal government to standardize electronic platforms and secure email technologies. And Miranda, your FTA technology um, task force is probably a great example of states working together on technologies to um, uh, standardize and make it easier for businesses to interface their systems with the state. Uh, provide a process for taxpayers to designate employees that can interact with the tax agency. This will go a long way uh, to help us. A lot of big businesses, if we can get things electronically and have one contact with the department and they have a contact with us, an electronic email for us, that they can use that contact information to get a hold of us timely and quickly and we can resolve issues and ultimately pay you faster. And then adopt statutes that automatically invoke relief provisions and provide authority for tax commissioners to take actions that will help us deal with tax compliance in times of emergency or disaster when it's been declared by either the president or the governor in your state. And there's some states that have something like this in place. For example, I think Oklahoma has a bunch of rules that come into place for tax compliance, but only when it's a tornado, which, you know, rightly so, they have a, a lot of experience, but trying to grow on that for all disasters will be um, helpful to everyone. And I think the task force itself has a facilitating rapid response to disaster act and 32 states have enacted that so far. It really only applies to restore critical infrastructure, but perhaps that's a model that can be used for other um, purposes as well. 
Last slide, please. So why should you care? I think if we improve the ability to uh, do tax, um, tax compliance more in a technology fashion, it will allow states and the private sector employees to effectively work from remote locations if it's necessary, permanently reduces the cost of purely administrative and record-keeping tasks, facilitates and um, speeds up the remittance of taxes by companies, it reduces our risk and costs from failure to remit taxes on a timely basis due to factors that are um, out of our control, including lost mail, uh, misdirected or sent to offices that are no longer in existence, and enables the state to provide immediate responses in time of emergency. So I'd be glad to take any questions on the topic. Thank you. Linda, are there any questions? Right, I don't see any questions right now. I think, I think we're okay to move on. Um, we can always take some questions later if we need to, uh, and we can re revisit at the end. But thank you so much, Deborah, and uh, we will move on to the next uh, presentation. Miranda? Hey, everybody. And uh, next slide. So much of what Deborah said, uh, yes, indeed, the industry and the state tax agencies are, are in many ways in their own boats, but in the same boat. Uh, the tax agencies are in various stages of telecommuting. Some are completely out of their buildings. Utah, of course, had to suffer through the earthquake on just about the first day that this all started, uh, giving it further complications. Uh, some have skeleton crews in their offices uh, dealing with that paper that Deborah referenced. Uh, some other things, obviously IT, uh, you need to have some people on hand to deal with that. They have been working to keep people separated. Some agencies have even put the people who have to be in the offices on different teams so that if one team gets sick or is, is forced to further uh, stay at home quarantine, then another team is in place to take over those particular duties. So a great deal of, of thought has, and strong management has been going on for the past month. And of course, this isn't going to end anytime soon. So it, it will be continuing even as the agencies are, are looking ahead to what it's going to mean to open their doors again, both to the rest of their employees and to the, uh, to the public. One of the things that took everybody's breath away early on was when the federal government extended the filing and payment due dates to July 15th. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this. Everyone's well aware of, of what happened. And I think everybody on this call is aware of, of what that meant to the states. Ultimately, they ended up having to move much, a significant amount of their uh, tax revenues from one fiscal year to another. This caused a wide deal of problems on top of all the other problems. And of course, you legislators well understand what that means. Your FY20 um, budgets and your FY21 budgets fell all to pieces overnight. Uh, so a lot of work's been going on on the budget that was is outside of the scope of what we normally deal with with an emergency. Uh, economic fallout of shelter at home is another thing the agencies are dealing with um, big time. I just wanted to refer you to taxedmin.org, FTA's website. Uh, there's a very detailed report on exactly what this means, and we will be updating that report. FTA's research economist, Ron Alt, has put that together based on information data from the states and from other sources. I think you'll find it readable, and I, I, we're, very, we're very proud of that piece of work if you want to understand where we are going with the budgets. Also, update that just a little bit. We get tax revenue reports um, earlier than some people do, and 
based on what about 20 states now have reported in on some of their April, looks like we're seeing tax collections decreasing at a median rate of nearly 40% in April. That's year over year. Uh, and again, that's a median rate. And that's April, which we know is going to be an unusual month in, in many respects. Uh, the delay in the income tax filing, extending the filing payment date is behind a lot of this. Uh, the income tax decreased by more than 56% among the states that we've heard from so far. Next slide. So the response, of course, the degrees of agency shutdowns, this obviously affects the taxpayers. It affects the management of the agencies. Uh, it affects their ability to work with the legislators on changing of the budgets. But there's good news coming out of this, and I wanted to bring some of this up. We're actually seeing good reports on telecommuting. There's, there's not a lot of data to back this up, but when we hear from the people who are in charge of large sections of the agency, for instance, for collections, uh, communications, they, they say that they are really seeing improvements, that, that people's spirits are high, that their numbers are up, that they are being able to function well with the equipment that they have at home, that they have been able to uh, deal with all the distractions that everyone has to deal with and that they're determined to make this work. Now, of course, it helps that in some parts of the agency, telecommuting was part of their life anyway, in particular audit and collections. To a certain extent, in some agencies, even taxpayer assistance, the telephone assisters, they were already in place. Other parts of the agency, they've had to make do. One of the responses has been for those people whose actual jobs could not be well moved to a telecommuting or for those who could not get the equipment to telecommute for a while, as we all know, the laptops sold out. And it takes time to set someone up so that you have a secure access into your, your office. Um, they did training. They found, their managers found valid uses of their time. Others were moved to other activities and they've been able to deal with some of the backlogs here and there. Uh, keeping everybody busy, even if some of their work hasn't been exactly what they usually do. This, all this, of course, has worked to improve morale. We've been hearing from some interesting ways that folks have gotten together on little group Zooms or, or had you know, just personal interactions trying to replace that camaraderie in the sense of working together that you lose when you're not in the office together. Uh, next slide. Oh, your first takeaway. Next slide. So this is a little obvious, but I, I really felt the need to say, obviously your budget plan that you've given the agencies has fallen all to pieces and it's going to continue to fall to pieces. The tax agencies are, they understand, they're like the other agencies. They are being told three, five, 10, 20% cuts in your current budget. At the same time, they have to pay for those computers that they just put in the field for people to be able to keep the tax agency open during this time and to keep the dollars flowing into the state. The buildings are being retrofitted. People are putting the clear screens in front of the people who are going to have to face the public or one another. Cleaning, obviously your cleaning expenses are going to be significantly higher. They're buying things that were not scheduled to be bought before. For instance, uh, in-person scheduling software. They're taking steps to know that yes, we need to have taxpayers come into the office no matter how much we do by phone, no matter how much we do remotely, you will need to have people come in for this or that. They're being very careful about looking to see where we can minimize that. But if you have to have people come in, obviously you want them to come in one at a time or a few at a time, depending on how your office is laid out, there may not be room for them to 
safely keep six feet apart in a line. So they're using scheduling software uh, to allow the taxpayers to schedule a time to come in. This is not expensive, but it's not easy either because you have multiple, it's, it's not just one person saying, I want to come in and talk to one person. You have many, many, many taxpayers trying to schedule something that could involve an entire team or division of the agency. And then people will need time off. Uh, they need to be able to say, I'm not available at this time. So it, it does take a real software to handle this. And then of course the email to say, or text, yes, it's your turn, come on into the building, that sort of thing. Plenty of these kinds of activities going on. Your IT is just having to buy some things it didn't have to buy before. You're gonna have more sick leave, sad to say. Um, a lot of people aren't going to be at their jobs for a while. That productivity is going to go down. Uh, next slide. So things to think about, and in particular, I wanted to uh, thank Deborah and Bruce Rutt Russ, I know, is coming up to say some of the same things about what the taxpayer needs are for both the large and the small taxpayers. I wanted to explain a little bit of that and to say a little bit of what is going on and maybe say a little bit about where, where the uh, legislators can be of help. One example of why things aren't perfect yet, electronic forms. By now, you might think, why on earth are there still forms that are being filed on paper, whether that is actual a tax filing or reporting of some kind? Well, this isn't entirely in the control of the tax agency. Okay, you have several things going on. You have your IT budget. You've got to prioritize. And most of the time, I know Julie's over there nodding her head at this, most of the time, when you're trying to bring on electronic forms, you're going to look at those that are most in use, that have the highest impact, that have the highest usage. And unfortunately for uh, a lot of the large taxpayers, their forms are important to them, but they're not the highest volumes. And so some of those get dealt with last. Also, these forms aren't created by the tax agencies. This is a third party activity. Uh, you have to, a, a company may create its own, but for the most part, you're, you're using companies that create forms and create electronic filing, and you're dependent on them to make these forms available. So there's a, a, a market out there to deal from. I did touch briefly on competing priorities. Uh, sometimes it's just, as much as you may want to do it, you've got to deal with the alligators at the same time the swamp is rising and uh, some things they, they'll get, just get to it later. Uh, I'm, I actually think many of the agencies are very proud of where they are now and happy this didn't happen three or even five years ago when things were much more paper-based and you didn't have the, the portals. Um, on the question of, of can't you email things can't you send documents in by email? A couple of issues there. You're going, what you're going to see is the agencies are using portals to deal with these issues. And portals, again, it's, it's a big IT lift and it takes time to develop them fully. It takes money to get the IT going to develop them fully. But you have to do most of this through a portal. Otherwise, we don't know, a tax agency doesn't know who it's dealing with. And believe me, there are a lot of people out there who would like to pretend to be AT&T or some subsidiary of AT&T and sending in information that you don't want them sending in or asking for information that you don't want them asking for. So one of those compelling reasons is taxpayer confidentiality. It's, it's not good and all, it is supreme. Uh, taxpayers, you can count on your data being held confidential and protected from attacks by criminals, by business competitors, by goofballs, or by anybody else. Also, many of, many pieces of data that a tax agency deals with 
involves federal tax information. That has to equally be held confidential, but it also has to be accounted for in very specific ways. And if the IRS doesn't approve of a process, you can't do it. Uh, you'd be shocked to find out how detailed this goes. That's just the world we live in and something we have to work with, but it's also why sometimes the world isn't as easy as we would like it to be. And then of course there are legal constraints with statutes weakening, uh, which is why a tax agency always hopes that a legislator, if, if they hear, hey, why we can't we do this, bring them in and talk with them and, and get their thoughts on it because one of the things they're always looking for is what's this mean down the line? Where are we going to have challenges, not for the taxpayer we're working with who has a legitimate request and a legitimate need, but it fits in with other parts of the statutes and it, they're gonna tell you that they feel they are at risk for losing something. It, it could be um, a tax position, it could be a, a case, it could be revenues, but if they're not taking a position, it may be because they, they need additional work on their statutes that you can help with. Next slide. Ah, next takeaway. I love this one. I bring it out pretty regularly. Uh, the tax agency's mission is to collect the correct amount of tax. It is not to balance the budget. You do hear this talked about. Media in particular likes to bring this up. Oh, look, here. We're having a tax crisis. We're having a revenue crisis. Uh, what does this mean for increased collections? My perspective is that the most, um, not aggressive, the, the most robust enforced collection you're ever going to see is during the good times. It's when the tax agency has money in its budget. It's had time for training. It's had time to bring people on staff. In the bad times, they're hurting for budget like everybody else. Most revenue collections are coming in voluntarily. They are not through collections, they're not through audits. If you just look at the big numbers, it doesn't even make sense to think that you're going to make any substantial difference in a shortage of your budget by doing additional collections. You will get some, but in terms of, of, is it incremental? Yeah, it, it's just not going to be enough to be able to fix your budget problems. You just have to sort of make that clear because you're gonna be hearing from reporters and you might wanna sort of adjust their thinking on that a little bit. One thing that you are going to see, and I don't blame my folks for doing it like this, is auditors and collectors are just the visible tip of this um, iceberg. You will see people come to you and say, oh, give us more budget, more money, we can hire more auditors and collectors, and we can bring in more money. That's true. It's not going to be enough to make a significant difference in, in a severe budget problem. It is true, but what is not being said is that if they do the same with more people who work in the voluntary compliance area, they can probably do even more. It's just harder to track and to show the numbers. So they don't talk about that part with you. The other thing to know is that you may, if you're tempted to say, I'm gonna give you money to hire some more collectors and some more auditors, understand that that's part of the team. A collector and auditor doesn't work alone. For ever so many auditors that you have, you have to have an increase in the legal staff. You also have to have an increase in the support staff and an increase in the IT staff. So if, if you're going to give money to the tax agency, part of my takeaway is trust the people you are giving your resources to, authorizing the resources for. Trust them to know what they're doing. Don't tie their hands, talk with them, ask them to show how they're spending the money, how they plan to use it, but listen to them as, as they tell you, we can't just hire an auditor, we have to hire these other people too, or in the end you end up with nothing, uh, without what you're hoping to get. Uh, next slide. <laughs> 
I've got a story to tell with this. Um, I did mention that, that most revenues are paid voluntarily. There's a lot that goes into voluntary compliance that people tend not to think about because again, you, you like to think about enforced compliance as being auditors and collectors. But Deborah really pointed out that what they're looking for is help in paying the tax. They're going to pay the correct amount of tax as best they understand it. They want guidance, they want good forms and instructions, they want the IT ability to file it electronically. Uh, to do that, you need other things, leadership development, um, definitely want to listen to the taxpayers as they tell these things. But here's, here's the story I like to tell that goes along with this. Back in the last century, there was a fellow in Australia named Alan Bond. He, he rose from nothing and, and from some light-fingered thieving, actual like breaking in kind of thieving, to become one of Australia's biggest, um, uh, well, he owned corporations. He owned gold mines, he owned buildings, he owned television stations, uh, very high profile and usually called the corrupt business dealings. In 1982, he was the bankroll behind the Australian America's Cup boat that won the America's Cup the first time the Americans had lost it. And I actually had, uh, he, he was hanging around Newport at that time. And so I got to hear him talk from time to time. One day I overheard him talking about a business acquisition he'd made. He had bought up another company. It, it, you didn't much use the term at the time, but you could also, you would have called him a business raider. He told this person, and the first thing I did when I bought this company was to fire all the communicators. And he sort of leaned over and said, and you know why I did that? Because they don't produce. Now, obviously, later out became known that he was a raider and he was just trying to buy these companies for their assets to use for his own purposes and then gut them and then get rid of them. Alan Bond ended up um, serving seven years in prison after pleading guilty to using his controlling interest in one company to deceptively siphon off another billion into another corporation. Uh, that always bothered me what he said about the communicators because I was one, but it just goes to show that the communicators have a hard time showing their worth. You don't count it the same way you can count audit and collection dollars, but that doesn't mean that they are any the less valuable or, or worthy of, of being supported financially. And again, if you look at what the taxpayers tell you they want, it's on the softer side. They, they want assistance in being able to file. Uh, next slide. Oh, a couple. Of, Excuse me, I dropped my notes. I wanted to share a few other good things that's happening right now in your tax agencies. Obviously, you know that everybody has changed their collections uh, in different ways and in different amounts, but liens are not being uh, imposed, collections are not being collected, new debts are going in the system, but the billings are not going out. Instead, the collectors have turned their attention to creating pay plans, uh, extending pay plans, liberalizing pay plans, those kinds of activities. And I was on a call yesterday with a bunch of collectors and it was really surprising what we were learning from this. The taxpayers that we are hearing from on the enforced collections are encouraging and happy, well, happy is a strong word, they're not unhappy. They're in a much better mood than we expected them to be for sure. They have been telling our folks that, that we thank you for being proactive, for reaching out, for helping us with this, for not just saying we're looking for money. Now they're, they're calling to say, we understand what's going on. Here's what we can do now. What else do you need us to do? Uh, Another thing that you want to know that your collectors are saying, they're looking at strategies on looking forward because they know that times are changing. They, know, they say they, they're aware that there needs to be an awareness that many, for instance, auditors, you don't want to spend time on an area of an audit if you know that taxpayer is not going to be able to pay at the end of it. You have a three-year look back. 
you may have had an audit issue three years ago, but that business is not in the shape that it is in today that it was three years ago. Um, so capability to make good on debts is going to be limited. Um, they are expecting to see more taxpayers pocketing their trust fund dollars. Uh, taxpayers who normally are, are good, honest taxpayers are going to be keeping their sales tax dollars or their withholding dollars to keep the doors open for a few more weeks. Um, basically, the message that they're using is pay what you can now and we will continue to work with you. Okay, next slide. I think I covered most of that and especially pay as much as you can now is the main message that we're hearing. Eyes wide open is recognizing that what we're going to see from the taxpayers going forward is going to be some different from what we've seen in the last five to ten years. Uh, next slide. Okay. And, and this is your takeaway from all of that, that agencies are talking among themselves. I took this as a quote from one of them. This is a good opportunity to look at the statutes and the tools that the legislature can give you to do more effective collections. They're going to come to you with some ideas. I think you're going to find most, if not all of these good ideas, ideas that you would be perfectly willing to consider. Uh, these are not stomping on people ideas. There, there are ways to deal with debts before they get out of hand, uh, ways to make things electronic instead of manual, ways to save money on the budget. And so you can look for that coming forward. Next slide. And I really had to, to put a plug in here to the NCSL. We, we work in the same building with them, at least during normal times. Uh, we've been spending even more time together on the phone in what, quite a few different ways in the last couple of months. Uh, you just can't imagine how important they are to the other agencies out there, to our ability to share information with you through them, but also to get information back from them so that, that we can more effectively do our own jobs. Um, they're, they're good people and they they've been spending nights and weekends doing work that you're probably not aware of and they're not going to bother to tell you about but i wanted you to be aware of that and similar to that you know we recognize that you are doing the same um, every elected official hopes to serve in, in the good times and this is the opposite of that you, your budgets fell apart underneath your feet you've got to redo the good work that you had already done I just want you to know that th those of us who work in states understand that and recognize it. And so I just wanted to say on behalf of everybody, thank you for that. And that's, uh, that's pretty much all I've got. Well, thank you, Brenda. I appreciate your, your nice words about um, what we're doing here behind the scenes, I guess. Of course, you folks are truly doing the same. Everyone, I think, has been working even more um behind the scenes and virtually than we ever have uh everyone that is the whole world i think at this point but um thank you again for your words and uh great presentation and um trying to see if we have any we had no questions right now but uh perhaps we're holding them for the for the end and that's perfectly fine um in the meantime we'll just uh transition to to our next presenter and um russ the floor is yours sir well, thank you. I need to mention up front that uh, I live on an island with somewhat unstable internet connectivity sometimes. And every once in a while, I will, it can lose me for, but usually only for a minute. So if you lose me, I'll be back. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, the task force for this opportunity. And I'm especially pleased to be able to be on with Deborah and Verenda. I've known both of them for many years, working with them first as a Washington State Tax Administrator, and now in the private sector for a certified service provider. I just want to mention one thing I especially like about the perspectives of each of them. One with uh, Deborah is that she works for a very large company, but it is by its very nature uh, structured to assist smaller businesses with their tax obligations. So she gets the complications that there are for both large sellers and small sellers. That's an important perspective. And honestly, my favorite thing about Verenda over many years is that I regard her as the keeper of steal this idea. 
and she is a strong advocate for stealing good ideas wherever you can find them to uh, improve administration and uh, education, and I think that's great. So I think there's some folks on this call who are not familiar with certified service providers and, and many of you are and so this will be a little redundant for you, but I just want to quickly recap what we do. Uh, certified service providers uh, help taxpayers with their obligations uh, in sales tax arena largely. And the, th the things we do for them include registering them in all the states where they need to collect doing their tax calculations. We integrate our software into the retailer's system. The software makes taxability determinations and assigns the correct tax rate and taxing jurisdictions. We do return preparation and electronically file those returns. Uh, we can do it through batch filing where that's available with states. The same with remittances, we electronically remit those and that can be done by batch filing. And we do the records retention that is uh, useful uh, to maintain for uh, auditing purposes. Uh, CSPs were originally developed in conjunction with a streamlined sales tax uh, effort, but we now provide the services we provide in all of the states and uh, the sellers who make sales and uh, we file in all 46 states. So it is not limited to streamlined states. So, I'm thinking the focus, so next slide, uh, which is, we're already turned to, is uh, giving sellers and administrators a, the assistance they need. And I'm thinking about this in budget terms. I know that you as legislators are facing huge budget and policy challenges without the usual time, the usual reflection, and the usual input that you have. And I know that budgets are in peril and for tax administrators as well as others. I think some of the important considerations for revenue agency budgets include uh, many of the things that uh, Verenda covered, uh, that auditors and compliance officers are not the only essential staff. A balanced staff to meet the needs of taxpayers and keep revenues flowing, I think is what you're after. And education is often the better investment over enforcement, and that is especially true in a time of crisis when taxpayers need guidance. Uh, so the folks who staff information lines, the folks who design websites and populate the websites with up-to-date information or in clear language and adjustable formats, those staff will be critical for both taxpayers and the rest of revenue agency staff. Uh, so determining who are essential staff requires a, a kind of nuanced evaluation. Uh, next slide. One of the most important things I think is to be flexible and that is to give your revenue agency the opportunity to maximize accurate tax returns by focusing on guidance and education and making administrative simplifications. And as I've mentioned for, before, stealing the best practices from other states. Uh, many agencies already have tools that they can work with for distressed taxpayers like voluntary disclosure agreements, hardship provisions, and others. Uh, let them have the leeway to use those uh, to provide maximum assistance to businesses while accurately collecting tax. I think uh, one of the things you might want to do is review with them if there are statutory changes that on an uh, upcoming emergency basis that could help them provide assistance to taxpayers that you would want to see. Uh, next slide. So we live in a world where I think we all know uh, sales online have been, been increasing hand over fist for several years now, many years now, actually. That trend is accelerating. COVID has turned out to be a real acceler accelerator. There's not a lot of data yet, but what we do have is pretty compelling. Uh, E-commerce is now 30% of retail as of 425. 2020. It was 13% as of 317, 2020. The source of that is Bank of America. E-grocery is up 50% according to Adobe Analytics. 
and March, on, March online transactions are up 74% according to ACI worldwide. We're gonna see a lot more data and I think it's all gonna trend in that direction. So the shape of the future is uncertain, but the new normal will not be the same as pre-COVID. We know that already. Uh, the march to an expanded online economy just picked up the pace. New habits are being formed by consumers and many of them are gonna stick. So next slide. I think what that means for you is that you really need to be paying attention to online sellers, really paying attention. Uh, and some of the things to note are at the top of the slide that they focus on selling products, not tax developments. They're unfamiliar with sales tax laws and compliance in many instances. Uh, they find that they face registration requirements and complex forms and that these are an obstacle to their complying. And it, it's uh, kind of the old adage about uh, you'll draw more bees and flies with honey than you will with vinegar. So it's, it's an important thing to think about. Uh, most of all, they need education and guidance and they need some simplifications. So the good news is that you're gonna have thousands and thousands of retailers submitting taxes to your states that haven't done so before. The bad news is they don't really know how to do it. They're, many of them are relatively clueless. Uh, you know, most of us live and breathe changes in sales tax. Most online sellers do not. Uh, they are less aware of their responsibilities. They are less visible to administrators. And many of them are not equipped to collect and remit tax in 46 sales tax states. And the same is true for many Main Street sellers who adapt and develop a strong online presence. Filing in 46 states is an entirely different ball game than filing in the state where you have nexus. So I've talked to quite a few tax administrators who, like me, have uh, taken careers as tax professionals in different manners, and many of them are shocked by how difficult and time consuming it is to register in many states. They're shocked by how much money they need to charge their clients for doing this in order for them to make ends meet. Next slide. So I would say that things that you need to consider, uh, administrators where you have the authority to do it and legislators where you need to give them the authority to do it, is to weigh Oops, this might be the uh, internet glitch he was mentioning. Russ, are you there? Okay. Tax information. He's provided. back. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Russ, you cut out for for one minute, starting at the the waive registration fees point. Okay, thanks. So yes, I do have an unstable connection. So the uh, point of this slide is that uh, there are things that we think need to be done to make it easier for folks to comply, especially online sellers. And that uh, in some cases, administrators may have the authority to do some of these things, but they may need legislative authority as well or a change in statute to make it possible. And the kinds of things that I think you ought to consider for online sellers uh, is to waive registration fees, provide a simple registration form and process, provide a simpler sales tax uh, return or simplified electronic return, provide liability relief when they use a CSP to make sure that they're filing accurately, and to provide clear guidance in multiple areas. And there's a lot where this is needed. And uh, I would point folks to uh, the NACSP, National Association of Certified Service Provider, input to the NTC Wayfair Implementation Work Group. And that covers a lot of those areas. And uh, I'll mention how to re find those resources at the end here. But the relationship between a state and a seller with traditional nexus and that of a seller with online presence is profoundly different. And I think that's why uh, you need to consider doing these things to help uh, online retailers uh, 
uh, meet their obligations. Uh, the, perhaps the most sage and practical tax manager I ever have known is Warren Townsend. And he always used to say, if someone wants or needs to throw money at you, get a bucket. I think that's still good advice. And I think that's what some of these reforms would do. Uh, next slide. In terms of future legislative action, I, we all recognize that right now you have enormous challenges with limited session time to meet them. And it's understood that you're in crisis mode and don't have time for every potentially good legislative idea. So I would encourage you to encourage your agency to do all it can with the administrative authority it has to accomplish your goals during this time period. Uh, if there's an additional authority you and they can quickly identify that would help the agency do that for you, then consider legislation that would, would give them that authority. What would be useful will vary a lot by state. Uh, so even though this is not a time for looking at lots of legislative proposals that don't deal with the immediacy of dealing this crisis, uh, it is the time to start keeping a list of legislative changes that make sense for the long term in an e-commerce economy. Uh, removing obstacles for online sellers so they can easily get plugged into your sales tax system and start sending you dollars seems to make eminent sense. Bigger changes may as well. Many states have looked to streamlined as a way to modernize. Pennsylvania uses CSPs differently in their own simplification model. Illinois, Connecticut, and New Mexico have taken steps in a similar direction, and there are other states considering other directions. Colleagues in the tax world are thinking about other major changes that deserve discussion. Uh, and I think about it. Is it likely a tax system that was designed in 1935 uh, is set up to deal structurally with an e-commerce world? It, it needs maybe a major overhaul. So these are things to think about when things settle down enough for you to return to that list, you will have some options for better positioning your state to take advantage of the e-commerce economy. Next slide. We of course believe that certified service providers can help. Uh, and I don't have not spent a lot of time talking about revenues and what we can do in regard to assisting with revenue collection. Uh, I didn't really see that as the focus of this presentation. Uh, you have a presentation on that next week, but I do want to refer you to, to uh, our uh, website. Software solutions make it easy for sellers to comply. So I, I'd say see our website at simplesalestax.org. It has a lot of useful background information. It has a technology brief on how the technology works uh, to make compliance easy. It has a revenue study uh, done by multi-state. It has uh, model legislation that you can consider and we're always happy to assist with considering other consideration of other kinds of legislation. And it has a provider contact information. Uh, we do want to be part of the solutions uh, that you work toward uh, to uh, get through this crisis and to develop stable funding. So uh, that concludes my presentation uh, and thank you for letting me participate. Thank you so much, Russ. I appreciate that. Um... Uh, we've got a couple questions, I think, in the chat box here. Um, Jocelyn, do you want to go through them until, uh, and we can please, and at this moment, you know, you can please go ahead and enter any other questions you have, and we'll, we'll take them up as they, as they come. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Erlinda. Uh, the first question is, have you heard conversations on what would happen to state tax filing deadlines past July? Uh, this is Verund. I think that one is for the tax administrators. If not, you can, you can be more specific. I'm assuming that is a reference to something that came out of the White House yesterday that the federal government might, might think about further extensions of deadlines into uh, October, even through the middle of December. And, and if that's the question, uh, no, we haven't had conversations about it because it just came out. And it's pretty hard to have a meaningful conversation about something when you have no detail on it. Um, we, 
I'm a little confused. Well, you can see the politics behind it. From a tax administration standpoint, most of the taxpayers get a refund. Those who have to pay, many of them went ahead and paid on April 15th anyway. Those who needed an extension, many of those who wanted to pay later found that they couldn't get the help they needed from their bank to delay their payment. They had scheduled it for April 15th. And the tax agency can't help you reschedule it. That's between you and your banker. And a lot of those ended up being paid anyway. So we're down to a pretty small part of the population um, that, that's there's significant dollars involved overall. Um, but in terms of individuals, not that many. So I'm not sure what the point would be, but uh, no. We haven't had conversations about it yet because we don't know what it would be. Thank you. The next question is in regards to Grubhub, DoorDash, Instacart, have states had issues collecting and remitting taxes? Are there any states looking to regulate to bring them in line with online? That's an emerging issue. And with all new business models, uh, it, it takes a while before it settles down. So it's still in what I would call the early stages of understanding. It's gonna be a different answer in each state it is, and a different answer with each of those business models because they work differently. Uh, where the actual sale takes place is different with each of those. Um, so that who's collecting the tax is different. Who's remitting the tax is gonna be different. Uh, so. To, I mean, the states are working with it. They're looking to see how does it apply. They're notifying those taxpayers while they think it applies. There's some litigation promise. Some legislatures are certainly looking to say, how do we want it to apply? And ultimately that is their decision. A state can only look at existing rules and regulations and statutes. Uh, so it's still very much a work in progress there. And the short answer to that is it can be what the legislators want it to be. Thank you. Those are all the questions in the chat box for now. Thank you, Jocelyn. Does anybody else want to ask another question for our presenters? Okay. Um, thank you again. I appreciate uh, all the time that you uh, took today to, to contribute to our discussion. Um, uh, you can always feel free, uh, participants, to email us the questions separately and we'll, we'll um, you know, forward them on to our presenters to get further clarification. That's always something we're happy to do in case you can't think of uh, your question right now or if something comes up later. Um, again, next week we're having our third uh, in our three series here, our trio of virtual webinars. Um, next week it's the, uh, as you can see, the pandemic and damage, damage done, and we'll be talking about revitalizing state revenue streams for sure will be a very spirited and interesting discussion that um, most states and um, friends will want to hear about. Um, I will also say that, uh, you know, it's, I think officially we'll be announcing on Monday that our summit will not be taking place. I think we kind of saw the writing on the wall, um, but more to follow on how we're going to be um, transitioning and pivoting and what we're going to be providing in terms of education, resources, networking um, in lieu of, or at least until we can have a larger meeting um, so that is uh, out there now. Our summit will not be taking place in August. Uh, and then also our SALT um, fiscal leaders reboot meeting that we were going to have in Park City in July also, um, I'm sure you could uh, have also figured out, is, is not going to be taking place. So we will be following up with you all shortly on how we're going to be uh, reinvigorating that um, next stage of our SALT task force and our fiscal leaders. Um, so stay tuned for some exciting news and some developments in that area. And of course, do uh, would appreciate any contributions and any ideas you have as we're innovating and moving forward. Um, as usual, we'd like to thank our um, SALT Task Force sponsors. Uh, without your support, especially in these times, um, you know, we, we uh, would not be able to put together this programming and be able to provide the resources to our SALT Task Force members and fiscal leaders. So thank you so much and uh, look forward to seeing you all again next week at the same time, 1 p.m. And uh, 
again, please feel free to reach out if you need to. Have a wonderful weekend.